1969 was the end of the most traumatic decade in American history and the beginning of the end of the longest and most controversial war we had ever fought. But, of course, the year was not without a few bright spots as well. The population would finally pass 200 million, and the unemployment rate was less than 3.5%. There was some concern about inflation. The prime interest rate would reach a record-breaking 8.5%. But with just about everyone working, including one woman out of every three in the country, the economy was not a major concern. The average working family would earn just about $10,000 in 1969, and with bread at 24 cents a loaf, hamburger at 62 cents a pound, and chicken at 42 cents, that 10 grand could go pretty far. 95% of our homes had television sets in 1969, but what they brought into our living rooms wasn't always entertaining. The daily reports of carnage and violence in Southeast Asia played a major role in shaping our national conscience. And sometimes even caused violence here at home. The first major television event of 1969 was the inauguration of America's 37th president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. There was the threat of rain on that January afternoon, but much more frightening was the threat of violence. Police and troopers were everywhere, some 15,000 of them, and so were the demonstrators. And many of them carried peace signs, like this one right here. Which, of course, was... Okay, buddy, just move along. Huh? That's causing any... You don't think that... I said move it. All right, all right. But in terms of the 1960s, the incidents were minor. The new president and his party pretended not to notice. It would soon become clear, however, that the youthful protesters of 1969 could not be ignored by the president or by anyone else. In 1969, with a lot of help from television, city streets and college campuses became America's new kind of town hall. The place to air your opinion on just about everything from A-bombs to zero population growth. But the most vocal and most violent demonstrations concerned civil rights and the war in Vietnam. Led by America's involved and active youth, the demonstrations sometimes became almost as violent as the matters they were protesting. Ironically, perhaps the most violent confrontation of the year concerned nothing more than a vacant lot, and at best had only a tenuous connection to the great moral issues today. It seems that the University of California purchased the lot near the Berkeley campus to build a dormitory. The lot was a gathering place for Berkeley's numerous street people, and when the university tried to claim its property, a battle broke out that would last on and off for over a month. The street people renamed the empty lot People's Park, and they were soon joined by hundreds of students and even some faculty members in the fight to keep it from the university. At its height, the battle spread from the park to the campus to downtown Berkeley. Governor Ronald Reagan declared a state of extreme emergency, called in the National Guard, outlawed student assemblies, and ordered a curfew for Berkeley. People's Park seemed almost forgotten in the battles that ensued. Using fixed bayonets, gas, and birdshot, the guardsmen confronted thousands of brick-throwing students. At one point, a helicopter was called in, spraying the students with the same type of gas then being used against the North Vietnamese Army. The battle over People's Park finally resulted in one death, hundreds of injuries, and the arrest of nearly a thousand protesters. Other violent student protests over such issues as the rights of black students and the elimination of compulsory ROTC classes broke out on such campuses as Columbia, Harvard, Cornell, and MIT.
San Francisco State, rioting broke out when President S.I. Hayakawa imposed new restrictions on students in the wake of massive riots at the end of 1968. Some 500 students were arrested. I want to make it clear to everyone that I'm determined to break up this reign of terror established by the anarchists. Hayakawa's firm stand gained him national attention. He would later be elected as a U.S. Senator from California. Perhaps even more significant in 1969 were the off-campus demonstrations by literally millions of students and others protesting the costly war in Vietnam. The largest came on October 15th and November 15th, known as Moratorium Days. On the first march, Martin Luther King's widow, Coretta, led thousands of protesters through the streets of Washington. And a million others marched in cities across the nation and around the world. Only one relatively minor incident marred the day in Washington when a group of protesters carrying Viet Cong flags tried to enter the White House grounds. Many political leaders of both parties supported the protest, but Vice President Spiro Agnew was outraged. He called the marchers an effete corps of impudent snobs. <laughs> 